So good morning, everyone. Uh, our uh, session will begin shortly. Many of you have been here before, but for those of you that have not, please remember to type your questions in the Q&A box. If you want to ask a question verbally, then raise your hand and we'll unmute you. And if you have any troubleshooting or technical problems, please uh, email Sidoni at the number there, at the uh, email address there. Next slide. We want to acknowledge uh, the land on which we host this session is the unceded and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples. That includes the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh nations, as well as the Métis Charter community of the Lower Mainland region. And uh, whilst we reflect on uh, weather and current state, et cetera, I wanted to share with you, uh, for those of you that are in Vancouver, have access to the Vancouver Art Gallery that uh, if you want to see a quite moving and interesting story um, at the Vancouver Art Gallery, there's a beautiful exhibit by Alanis uh, Obama Swing called The Children Have to Hear Another Story. And it's a quite powerful uh, visual and artistic view of what uh, this 90, now 91-year-old Indigenous woman has done to improve uh, Indigenous rights over the course of the last 60 years. And it's uh, really quite a moving and visually excellent, but it reminds us also of the relationship that Indigenous people have always had with the land, um, which I think is quite fitting for today. And uh, so I just, that would be my reflection or thought for today. Next slide. So Province-Wide Rounds, as you know, is a collaboration between UBC and BC Renal and uh, working with all of our health authority partners and all of our uh, industry partners, uh, we strive to bring you high level education and other opportunities for thoughtful dialogue. And this is yet another one of those moments. Next slide. So it's really a privilege to be able to present uh, and introduce Dr. Carolyn Stigant. Um, her self-bio wants me to uh, let you know that she's a mother, gardener, educator, and a climate activist, as well as a nephrologist, and she's been developing and practicing environmental sustainable care. She conceived and delivers the undergraduate UBC lecture called The Climate Crisis, Planetary Health and Medical Practice, and is working with UBC Medicine to embed planetary health across the spectrum of learning uh, within the new strategic plan that the university has undertaken. She is the medical lead for Islands Health Climate Change Steering Committee and serves as the Canadian Society of Nephrology's SNAP, or Sustainable Nephrology Action Plan Committee, chair. She's the founding member of an emerging international collaboration that uh, you, uh, under ISN called Green K Initiative. And she's a collaborator on BC renal funded projects looking at environmental impact and the range of kidney replacement therapies. So, on this very fitting day before Earth Day, um, I'd like to ask Carolyn to take it from here and uh, remind us all the things we need to do and need to stop doing. So over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> this is uh, one of my favorite pictures of the, uh, the rainforest in Euclid. Um, so I'm speaking here um, in Victoria on the lands of the Esquimalt uh, and Songhees uh, peoples. I live in the Wasanich area. And that's where most of the intellectual development has taken place. And this beautiful picture is the ancient cedar rainforest in Clulet. So these are my conventional disclosures. And I've chosen to put here <clears throat> some personal information, which I thought was relevant to this talk. And I thought also holds me to accountability. Um, I'm striving still with this emissions, and I think that it's really important that we normalize talk about carbon and understand our own uh, personal impact, as well as the professional impact that we're going to hear about in the coming hour. So these are today's objectives. <clears throat> Some of this stuff is hard to look at, and I gave a similar lecture to the medical students um, earlier in the week. And I, this one really gives pause for thought. When you think back to pre-industrial times, or technically we were just in the early industrial revolution in 1800, but the greenhouse gases emitted per year from people was 9 million um, tons. And it's sitting at over 35 billion per year. 
uh, that's an extraordinary amount, and it reflects sort of the sum total of human uh, enterprise. And this graph uh, here shows uh, the, imp the impact of Canada. You can see that little almost flat line along the bottom there, seemingly. Um, we are um, emitting about 2% per year. And given our northern geography and our cool climate and our vast distances, you can see that the emissions by sector and activity are not terribly surprising. Canada's cumulative emissions, um, since uh, we, we can estimate back, are 32 billion, so nearly what the world emits per year. So we're small in the scheme of things, but we're large on the impact of things. So uh, there's this concept of Earth Overshoot Day, and this is the date when the demand for Earth's resources exceed the regenerative capacity. I'm not gonna tell you what year I was born in, but the year I was born in, it was Christmas day. And here we are, if the average citizen, the carbon expenditure of the average citizen now, Earth reaches its regenerative capacity on July 7. But if everybody in the world lived the way like we do in Canada, um, it, we would be looking at um, uh, March the 13th, we've already exceeded. And to me, this is the most powerful um, slide in the IPCC. And we're going to focus just on the top part here, the atmospheric carbon dioxide. I showed a, a close up of this last year, and this is where we are now. We're at about double the um, recent historic on Earth scale, which is 800,000 um, years back, double the level. And the projections show that the most optimistic um, outcome here um, for CO2 is this line, this SSP126, the blue line on the bottom. Um, and the more realistic trajectory with the current promises um, and changes that states have made is this middle or yellow line. And the sort of uncontrolled increase is the red line. So you can see on the bottom, um, the surface temperature projections as well. And if you just kind of draw a um, horizontal line back, you can see that we're currently in a range that's like 9 million years ago, well before the current interglacial um, period, and, and really tracking way back um, into our planet's history for when we had similar atmospheric conditions. So this is uh, our little um, modern Holocene epoch here, and, and we're getting back to the territory of the beginning um, of the Cenozoic era. So healthcare has a, a considerable impact, roughly equal to airplane travel. Um, and the statement has been made that if healthcare was a country, um, that it would be responsible, it would be the fifth highest emitter worldwide. Sorry, I'm just gonna change my view here. Um, this, this slide shows um, the NHS has determined uh, where the emissions come from. Um, and you can see here that the, what we call the supply chain makes up the majority of these. And within that, uh, medication, uh, various chemicals, disinfectants, and so forth in that category. But other major categories are building energy, water and waste, the anesthetic gases and meter dose inhalers have special notice, and then transportation is a lot of it. So uh, Andy Connor was a, a sustainable nephrology fellow in the UK back in 2010. Um, and in studying their program, uh, they had a breakdown that was actually quite similar to this. So we'll keep these big emissions categories in mind as we come to um, our action plan. So we've got increasing data here that kidney disease and climate change have a what we call a bi-directional relationship. Each impacts each other. And um, here we see a variety of different ways that um, climate may affect kidneys through, through heat and heat-related disease, volume depletion, acute, and probably leading to development of chronic kidney disease, irrespective of environmental toxins, um, the infectious disease burden, and then increased air pollution as well. So again, in previous years, I'd shown how those uh, small particles, so-called particle pollution, the PM 2.5s, um, have in one analysis been estimated to cause um, or be associated with uh, 60,000 to 108,000 prevalent chronic kidney disease cases in Canada alone and 3 million cases worldwide. 
And this slide demonstrates then in turn the other impact, and that's that for kidney disease, uh, it has a significant uh, impact uh, on our care delivery systems in terms of patients really being hospitalized, um, in terms of providing dialysis and transplant. And I'll share some of our exciting data with you on that in the coming slides. Um, but just wanted to show you some highlights of uh, some other people's published data thus far, that a single hemodialysis treatment in a North American setting was was equivalent to driving a vehicle 238 kilometers. That's pretty significant. And if you consider, again, the sum total of patients dialyzing frequently, this is a, a very considerable um, cost. Um, since money talks, uh, it talks to us in different ways than kilograms of CO2 emissions does, I thought it would be also impactful to show some data from Japan, um, where they've done an analysis um, looking at the, their hemodialysis population and the healthcare harm that's caused by the pollution that they have determined through life cycle assessment studies to cause. And the bottom line impact here is that for all the patients on hemodialysis in Japan for one year, the associated healthcare pollution causes patient harm to the tune of $28 million US. So I thought that was quite significant. I will just point out that this is um, this data in the North American setting is towards the higher end of the range of the published data, but it is the newest and biggest um, published publication to date. Um, looking at the impact of hemodialysis. I'm not showing um, in the same level of detail about peritoneal dialysis and transplant. We don't have as much data. Um, and the one study that's been published thus far on PD comes from Hong Kong. Um, and you can see across um, the range the considerable variability in hemodialysis. Um, it's felt, however, that PD probably in its total sum um, has a similar impact because uh, we don't have data on um, the production of the dialysate, which of course requires a lot of ster sterility. It requires a lot of plastic. It requires a lot of transportation of heavy um, fluid filled bags and so forth. So um, some non-published uh, assessments on that are that PD is probably similar um, and then transplant data thus far has only been shown in abstract, uh, and that was back in 2016. This data not subsequently published, unfortunately, but considerably lesser impact. So I'll show you some exciting BC updates on that in the slides to come. So uh, this is another figure that I think tells it all. Um, in order to uh, limit our warming uh, to 1.5, uh, we need to reduce our emissions by 45% by 2030, is what an international group of scholars writing uh, in the IPCC report tell us. We're currently on track to 2.7 degrees warming. And that includes um, the pledges um, which were made at the COP26 meeting. So that seemed to be a real breakthrough meeting where a lot of pledges were. But even with all of those pledges, as shown in this line here, we're still on track to being 13.7% higher by 2030 than we were in 2010, not to our goal. And so you can see these different emission scenarios that the sooner we get it down, the deeper and the more prolonged and better the benefit. So there is this real um, importance on um, prompt action. So this is really a shout out um, to the um, resiliency of uh, the people that work in the system, everybody here, um, that uh, we're talking about climate change mitigation here, where this talk really is geared to reducing the impact, but we have to talk about adaptation as well. And that's not the focus of this talk, but um, this is just a really um, great job for all of the challenges that we've had lately. Uh, and this picture may be familiar to you. It came in a renal newsletter um, with the headline, not one missed run when the dialysis unit had to relocate um, some years back from a forest fire da uh, danger. So um, when I was giving this planetary health lecture at UBC, I never really thought that the definition of planetary health, which is um, the um, impact on human health of the human caused changes in Earth's natural systems, it never occurred to me that that could be sort of a um, 
I guess what we would call now a colonial perspective. Um, and I came across this publication, which is now really broadly used um, within planetary health. Um, and that's this indigenous consensus one, which um, focused on earth-centered values, um, reciprocity and responsibility, and viewing human values as one with biospheric values. And I must say on a personal level, this resonates um, much more closely with me. Um, and I think it's really important to note that Indigenous peoples live on 20% of Earth's surface, and they're in relationship with more than 80% of existing biodiversity, and hence Indigenous rights and land tenure are a key tenet um, to environmental stewardship and to the climate crisis. This is a tough one to look at as well. Um, I think it's the, the head of the UN has said there can be no stable climate without biodiversity. So this was in the news last November when we had this Kunming Montreal biodiversity framework. And the headline that came out of that was 30 by 30, meaning 30% 30 of the planet to be set aside, 30% of degraded ecosystems to be restored and under protection by 2030. And you might be surprised to know in Canada, I thought intuitively we would have more than 30%. We've got this vast north, we look at our map, it looks undeveloped, but in terms of what's actually been designated, it's not held by a private individual, it's not held by a mining or a forestry company. Canada has designated about 13% of our land mass thus far, and BC is the leader at that in just over 19%. So there's clearly some ways to go. And these wild species really need habitat protection. Um, this report shows that um, shocking one in five species is at risk, and there's a lot of species that we have, and um, as many as half of them, we can't even rank what their category is because there's insufficient knowledge. So moving on from that background information, um, we're going to go into uh, the local, regional, and international developments um, that are happening now in environmentally sustainable kidney care. So on the left is a photo that a patient sent me of her home hemodialysis garbage for one week. Um, she couldn't afford to dispose of the garbage for the second week, so she would pack it up and take it to her brother's condominium and dispose of it in a dumpster in that setting. There is no domestic or household waste in that bin. And I'm sure this is not a surprise to any of us who look after the home dialysis patients. And on the right, also not a surprise to us, uh, the tubing and dialyzer uh, consumed in a single hemodialysis treatment. So hearing increasingly from patients, I'm sure uh, many of us are, um, and seeing ourselves and being kind of distraught at, at uh, the waste and how we can tackle this. So um, the first uh, one of the projects that we did was with um, the visiting um, fellow, uh, Nisha Rao, who's since returned to Australia. But Nisha brought this really interesting perspective with her because in Australia, when Baxter um, delivers the supplies to a patient's home, they pick up the spent um, recyclable dialysate. So they give the patients a green bin and the, the polypropylene outer wrap material and the inflow dialysate bag, the PVC material, they collect those and take them back for recycling. So that onus is not upon the patients. And we thought, hmm, I wonder how many plastics uh, there are here. And the, a real impetus for this was at the time we were looking at trying to get a PVC medical plastics recycling program. Um, and this was going to be data that fed into that. And so you can see the numbers for BC at the bottom here. For polypropylene, um, it adds up, right? This is one year's worth, and for PVC plastic, over 92,000. And then we looked at databases and um, we got the prevalence of um, the number of people on PD in Canada and in the US. We got an estimate for the world. And here we are at over 30 million kilograms of recyclable PVC plastic. We don't know how much of this is being recycled, but presumably a very small amount of that. And so we have given this data to our colleagues at the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare. Um, and they're using this uh, to look at uh, a nationwide um, PVC plastic recycling program expanding beyond pilots that currently exist in the lower mainland area and in the greater Toronto area. So that would that in turn fed into the fact that um, what we all know, we function within these big systems, and it quickly became evident that a national voice was going to be required, um, and national thinking, and more people um, to help solve these kinds of problems. 
And so um, our committee here uh, has a mission to educate, innovate, and advocate for sustainable kidney care. And I, I focus on these words, like I just keep coming back to that. And it just is such a motivating and um, grounding mission statement. And we've been uh, meeting now for 15 months, and I wanted to share with you here some of the key achievements. So I'm, I'm really proud of our committee. I, I think we've done a lot of good work. Um, and I wanna thank everybody. I suspect there's many of you on the um, conference today who participated in our recent survey um, and hoping to have some data to share um, with the community about that soon. We just um, closed that survey. So thank you for your participation. Um, the CSN is one of the first uh, uh, kidney societies worldwide to have an uh, abstract prize in green nephrology or environmentally sustainable kidney care, and that inaugural prize will be given at the upcoming CSN meeting in Halifax in, within the month. And uh, next week, in fact, on Tuesday, our committee is meeting with some industry representatives. We've invited them um, to this uh, long-awaited, long-hoped-for what we're calling a green industry fair. Um, so this is where they have the opportunity to, pre uh, to present processes and products um, that are um, environmentally sustainable, uh, progressive, available now, available into the future. And we're hoping for a moonshot vision of a zero waste, um, low energy, uh, low carbon uh, product. We published uh, the planetary health framework and that was what I had presented last year. So that's nice to see that that's now in press. Um, and um, we have uh, collaborated with Cascade. So that's creating a sustainable Canadian health system in a climate crisis uh, is what that acronym stands for. This is a Health Canada funded initiative um, to implement uh, low carbon and, and sustainable care throughout Canada um, and creating an infographic. And I'll show you some pages of that uh, infographic coming up. Um, Dr. Rajan and I um, are guest editors um, on a special uh, sustainability collection of the CJKHD, which we've called Introduction, Perspectives and Pathways to Low Carbon Kidney Care. And uh, a special thanks to people who I've named on these slides, again, hoping um, you're here today and getting the credit that you deserve. But I think this is probably the slide that I'm most proud of in this entire presentation, um, because I'm really grateful to the community for being receptive um, and collaborative um, in developing a whole host of um, environmentally sustainable um, contributions in this area. So stay tuned for that. And, you know, on a similar theme uh, to how we needed to go national is, again, yeah, you know, we're a fairly small market in Canada, um, but again, these are big international systems, and so realized we needed to um, take a, take another step and and develop an international initiative. Um, so I wanted to share uh, this um, editorial, which has just come out. Uh, in um, January, actually, it's it, it was written just in uh, uh, e. Uh, e-publication, but it's going to come out in the July uh, print edition of Kidney International. So this was, uh, I, I think, a, a pretty milestone development um, where we're calling for development of climate resilient kidney um, care systems. And we lay out a, a pathway and a series of targets um, through a variety of uh, educational, um, procurement, infrastructure, innovation, and clinical care pathways. So stay tuned, uh, stay tuned for that. This was the key graphic uh, from here and I've included, I love this little kidney hands picture. That was uh, something that the ISN um, with, with great thanks crafted. I think that's a very effective graphic. Um, but you can see that this is really not an unfamiliar message to any of us here um, with the clinical framework ascending from um, health promotion activities, identifying kidney disease, um, risk factors early, lifestyle changes, identifying um, kidney disease early in its course, again, lifestyle therapies, pharmacotherapies, which um, we're having a, a growing number of now, thankfully, non-dialysis management when appropriate and when available, and then lastly, sustainable powered and produced, ideally low impact net zero waste. So we can see here as kidney function declines, the adverse impact environmentally of our kidney therapies occurs. And obviously this um, 
the preferred framework here um, fits into our clinical framework, uh, patient preference, prioritization, and therapy of cost as well. So we're looking at providing an environmental perspective on this existing framework. Um, and that leads me to the work that we're doing um, with BC Renal in conjunction with the Planetary Healthcare Lab and uh, some, some colleagues uh, uh, here in BC on our life cycle assessment work. So um, most of you may not be familiar with life cycle assessment. I wasn't until we started doing this. It's been a very uh, steep learning curve. Um, but um, LCAs, as, as well abbreviate to calling them, um, is a process where we can compare basically apples and oranges environmentally. So different products or processes um, can uh, we can uh, determine this environmental impact. So we look at a broad range of raw materials and energy inputs. Um, we map out the processes and then we determine the emissions. Um, and it provides, uh, as I say, all of this endpoint, but we're really gonna be focusing today on the climate change data. So to be clear uh, in what we're talking about, we're talking about carbon pollution um, from our therapies and not yet focusing on these other aspects. This is very busy. No one is meant to read this slide, but this is meant to be um, an impressive graphic so you can see the extent um, of the work that goes into this. So when we do our LCAs, it's kind of like the, the um, when one is developing a clinical trial and we draw up inclusion criteria, patient inclusion criteria, um, this is basically uh, the process after we've done the inclusion criteria. What we're mapping is one patient receiving one therapy for one year. And so we're um, looking at kidney transplantation, uh, deceased donor kidney transplantation. We're looking at uh, in-center hemodialysis and we're looking at uh, Cycler PD. Now we're looking at other modalities as well, but for the data that I'm showing you today, it's a comparison between these three modalities. And so we have had our researchers um, and uh, Dr. Rajan has been very involved with this, um, go into operating rooms, um, measuring every single thing, the, the peel away sheet that comes on the uh, syringe, uh, the IV tubing, the needles, the gauze, the gauze, the, the packaging on the gauze, um, the uh, energy spent in the warming, um, every single input into a deceased donor kidney surgery, starting from the time that the patient drives into the center. The five-day hospital stay was modeled um, care for um, the, or the, the second surgery, I should mention as well, of the, uh, the donor. And then one year of follow-up. I want to be really clear that we are not including medication in this analysis because we do not have data from about pharmaceuticals, and we're not including lab uh, data as well. So here, this is uh, mapped through this entire process, and there's a similar diagram for each of our dialysis modalities. And I've chosen to present today um, the uh, visual um, graphic that was made by the social media team at the World Congress of Nephrology. So we just presented this in abstract form there. Um, and this was a special abstract of interest, and it was the one that they profiled on their mail out. So we were really pleased with the interest uh, and attention that it got. Uh, and the bottom line really is in this uh, red box in the center of the screen, showing the kilogram CO2 um, equivalents emitted. So this is 3.96 tons in hemodialysis in center, 1.37 in cycler dialysis per year, and uh, uh, 3.6 in kidney transplantation. So that's summed up in the little brown box above that in climate change impact that hemodialysis has 91% more impact than kidney transplantation and 65% more impact than PD. So um, again, this was uh, looking at our process. This is not looking at the manufacture of the PD solutions either. Um, there is considerably more water used, obviously, uh, in hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. And again, if we're looking globally at the, at the water usage, um, this is an underestimate of, of PD because we're not including the manufacturing of these solutions. So we just have to be careful that we understand how we're interpreting this data. 
The richness of uh, the LCA methodology allows us uh, to determine as well um, the hot spots or the key sources of uh, the emissions uh, for each therapy. So you can see here in these pie charts for kidney transplant, hemodialysis, and PD going left to right, that some big themes have come out, that the major, major uh, sources of emissions, um, to my surprise when I saw this data, were from the commute. So again, this is modeling a patient over a year. So this is a patient coming in uh, for transplant clinic appointments, and this is a patient coming in for hemodialysis. A quick word again about interpreting this data is that this initial modeling was done with a patient from the lower mainland, and the commute distance that was assumed was 15 kilometers. So this does not apply to people who are in rural settings who are driving much further distances. And uh, again, it reflects the first year of clinical practice. So there may be less commute, for example, in subsequent years in transplant if there's more virtual visits that are done. In PD, you can see the bulk um, is uh, related to consumables. And consumables is a major category otherwise. So those are, again, the, the tubing, uh, the, the bags, the dialysate, um, the, uh, all of the, the dialyzer in hemodialysis. So all of the supplies, the things that you saw in that bin in that uh, earlier picture. So this is uh, the summary of the data um, showing BC here. And again, everyone's got slightly different uh, things that they uh, include and slightly different ways that they measure this. Ohio uh, is um, the other LCA that's done. That's why I put it in bold. So we have LCA data in BC, which is really now the gold standard of doing this, as does Ohio for hemodialysis. Um, and they did a very different um, type of analysis uh, I'll, I'll spare the details, but um, I think ours is uh, is certainly more accurate and probably considerably lower because we don't have coal as an energy source. We have renewable um, hydro energy predominantly. Um, our data was very comparable um, thus far to the uh, previously published data, and uh, this is shown uh, data shown for the first time here uh, for deceased donors, uh, much less impact. So um, stay tuned for. Uh, more analyses on different uh, therapies as we embark on analyzing the home hemodialysis comparison between uh, cycler uh, dialysis and CAPD, and we're also going to look at uh, conservative care. So this leads me to by far my favorite part of this talk, and um, I spend a whole lot of my time thinking about uh, what to do um, personally and professionally uh, in this action. So just a little bit of background uh, for people um, in creating your own plan. I don't think it's for me to create a plan for you. Um, so these are principles, uh, a ladder of engagement. So um, think about the levels that you're interacting at and where these levers of power might be. So micro is at individual patient level or perhaps in dealing with colleagues. Meso would be at the system level, perhaps within your program, within your hemodialysis or home dialysis program, your transplant clinic, perhaps within um, BC renal, BC transplant, and the macro scale would be bigger things like uh, uh, international or, or national level. And we can also think about the spheres that we can influence. So today, of course, we're talking about work and patient care, um, but learning is attached to that. How we may choose to live um, uh, may be important to us, um, how we choose to invest our, our, our money um, and uh, activism or advocacy that we may uh, choose to uh, embark on. I love this slide. So I've spent a lot of time on the drawdown.org website. So Project Drawdown is, um, it's a, it's a, privately funded think tank, really environmental think tank with uh, a whole bunch of engineers that um, look at ways, they look at all of the international data and they're trying to come up with a plan um, to, to get emissions down quickly. So they really buy into this notion of how to get emissions down. Sorry, this is a little bit blurry, but um, basically they look at all these hot spots of energy expenditure and they've got um, satellite data for methane emissions. And it's just extraordinary the amount of data that's used. But uh, I think we can learn from this, uh, that they talk about super high emitting areas and how we can put emergency brakes on, um, new low carbon systems innovations, social interventions that can happen, nature-based removal and new technologies. So stuff uh, for, I think, for themes for all of us to learn. 
And uh, the NHS has this graphic as well, this pathway to net zero. And it's you can see it, there's there isn't there's big categories. So again, the supplier alignment, but how much control do we have over the supplier? You know, low carbon substitutions and product innovation and our day to day work in our units. We don't have a whole lot of power over these things. So so what can we do? And it's it's it is true that every little bit counts. And that's why I've, I wanted to really focus on this lecture as as the power of you, because we're going to show you how to empower um, yourselves and, and make these changes. Um, last week, I had the privilege of presenting at the uh, Low Carbon Care um, Summit of the uh, BC Patient Safety uh, and Quality Council, and this was very much a theme at this council, is uh, that environmental sustainability, rather than looking upon it as sort of an eighth added metric or outcome uh, as quality care, is that it's embedded. It becomes part of what we do, a prerequisite goal and outcome. Mm -hmm. And I love this um, quote that came from from, um, project drawdown that every job is a climate job. So this is the uh, infographic um, that I referenced earlier uh, from Cascades. There's many, many pages of it, so I'm not showing it all. Um, and there's uh, two links there, uh, both to the Cascades website where this can be found. And many thanks uh, to BC Renal for putting this as well on our environmental sustainability page. Um, and uh, I just you don't have to read this all, but just wanted everybody to understand uh, we've got uh, the whole framework is, is what we're planning on and to really consider your sphere of influence and action in going through these. So again, you don't, don't need to read this, but just the big themes, very much like that green K triangle, promoting um, rec early recognition of disease, optimizing uptake, uptake of kidney transplantation, engaging in medication stewardship is a major theme, um, appropriate prescription modifications, and not shown on this slide or some other things like uh, infrastructure improvements, maybe like our RO systems, for example, or acid uh, concentrate delivery for hemodialysis. So this is a huge and how do we go about this? And these are really, I think, very helpful guiding principles. Choose things as inspired by drawdown that are high impact. Choose things where we can build, have some success to build on. Choose things where we can get other hands on the job, expanding the workforce, every job being a climate job, and leveraging um, the advantages um, that we already have within our system. So the highest impact really um, always lies with prevention. And here I think um, our kidney care nurses in, in particular um, are really poised within our system to do good. I think also consultant and nephrologists um, and any of us who can impact um, our primary care partners. One of our outreach within SNAP is to primary care for how we can get better early identification and awareness of kidney disease, um, particularly with changing climate. So to be effective um, in our prevention and uh, prescribing the new medications uh, that we have available that we've uh, heard so much about recently. Um, again, when uh, the next highest impact non-dialysis management, when appropriate, when available. And then in terms of a hierarchy of impact for dialysis therapies, um, and I want to be careful that I'm not suggesting that we prescribe specifically for the environment, we are prescribing for our patient, but we may expect that this may become more uh, important to patients, and we ought to be data driven if we're having these discussions. Further, if there is equipoise as it exists and patients aren't sure, this may be something that we choose to discuss with patients. So using this information, we can now say that we have data that peritoneal dialysis has a lower impact than hemodialysis if we're looking at a home therapy. I have not shown you this data, but a little sneak preview um, of our findings is that next stage has approximately 50% less um, climate change impact than the Baxter system, um, regardless of whether it's a conventional uh, four hours, three times weekly versus a more intensive um, prolonged um, hours uh, and more frequent dialysis. And uh, next stage has about 20% the climate change impact of in-center and Baxter about 40%. Um, another uh, 
thing that we have good data for is low, low carbon transport to places of work and therapy. I fully recognize that these are not available for all patients or for all staff, but for those of us who it is um, possible for, um, this has impact. This is one of our highest impact categories, recall, for um, clinic visits and for coming uh, to, to our workplace and to patients for their therapy. So we're in the progress of looking at transportation as a whole in BC, transportation to dialysis. Um, and we're going to use this data to advocate for um, low carbon transportation and specifically for um, uh, electric uh, handy darts and public transportation systems. The supply chain is another one. So this huge category of supply chain. And I think we have um, growing impact in this area. Um, big markets, the bottom line is that big markets are going to generate change. So in Canada, we're pretty small. And this is part of my hope for this green K um, is that we can have a lot of smaller players coming together um, and having a voice along with the bigger players. But on a positive note, um, you may have heard about the COP26 climate agreement, um, and that's morphed into this uh, acronym ATTACH. Um, and there's 63 signees here internationally, so that's what this map shows. Um, there's some obvious big uh, absences in it, but nonetheless, there's going to be collective um, negotiating power um, it, within these systems. There's also some hope for the um, supply chain and procurement in that the U.S. Uh, has a health sector climate pledge. Um, and they've had some very major players come out uh, committing to 50% um, reduction in greenhouse gases by as soon as 2030. Um, some major pharmaceutical companies have joined that, and interestingly, the DaVita um, network within the U.S. has signed on to the health sector climate pledge, so hopefully there's some changes coming in the dialysis environment. Um, the U.S. has also uh, stated its ambition to align with NHS procurement, and they have uh, the most progressive, I would say, um, uh, uh, procurement strategy uh, that uh, that we know of, um, and they're aiming to have all of their direct um, and um, supply chain emissions get to net zero by 2045. So it's a very significant ambition and involves a lot of work with procurement partners. Europe, similarly, they have a, a big market and they have this uh, Green New Deal aiming to be carbon neutral by 2050. So I think there's um, some hope uh, within uh, the supply chain. Canada has an agreement as well. It's not specific to health, but for um, suppliers of contracts in any jurisdiction um, that's over $25 million, um, there is uh, a requirement to submit a plan and to submit uh, steps to uh, reducing uh, the, their direct and indirect or supply chain uh, emissions as well. Another quick win um, is to reduce or choose less carbon intensive work travel. Um, and this is just a, a nice little snapshot here from the recent World Congress meeting. This is what it looks like when I joined it um, virtually. So it's uh, quite navigable, um, quite user friendly. Um, and on the right, um, this is taken from the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology Journal. It's, it's, it's just home. And I thought it was uh, kind of uh, local and kind of neat. They show the carbon emissions by mode of transport to the meeting. Um, and in uh, they modeled two scenarios, the meeting that they hold in Toronto and the meeting that they hold in Banff. And so the average per attendee emissions are shown there. So again, uh, the average emissions for a Canadian are 15 tons. So we're talking like a 30th, uh, 1 15th to 1 30th ish um, of uh, a person's yearly emissions um, on work travel. So um, fair, it all adds up, right? Fairly big impact. Another quick win um, is a consumables management strategy. Um, and this has been demonstrated to save a lot of money. 
Um, and uh, I will say anecdotally uh, from this QI waste audit that we did last year um, with uh, fellow Justin Cheng um, at RGH in St. Paul's, it, it seems to make us happy. And, and that certainly makes me happy. So with a simple intervention, we could increase the amount of plastics that were recycled. So that's one local bit of data. But I want to show you what I think is some really striking data from the NHS. They have a position at um, in uh, the the um, Dunfer line um, unit where they hired uh, what they called a green nurse, and they hired this nurse to work four hours per week with a job of reducing consumables use, um, diverting clinical waste, so less of the waste goes into biohazard, um, and they also have a lot more circularity within their um, waste uh, chain there. So there were a variety of other tasks, but shocking savings. I, I mean, this is over $70,000 a year that was saved. So I'm certain that this investment in four hours per week pays off. And um, Anita, uh, can it here in Duncan and uh, Victoria community units, I want to give a big shout out to um, her, her data will be published um, in part of our sustainability collection. Um, she's been working with others, uh, Sarah uh, from BC Renal included, on uh, developing a similar sort of strategy that would work within our setting. Um, and uh, maybe when we get to the discussion, Sarah might might like to fill us in on, on some of that. But I think there's a lot of promise in introducing something like this locally. Another quick win is a medication reduction strategy, and it's really impressive the amount of work that's um, uh, happening here at um, within CanSolve, um, and just sort of putting an environmental lens on it. Uh, Dan Martinusen and I had a brainstorming session when we were going through our uh, med rec when I was in the renal unit a few weeks back, and um, stay tuned for um, perhaps amalgamating uh, some of those uh, inputs, but, you know, really big impact here in getting rid of intravenous medications. There's all that less plastic, less sterility, less energy uh, used in preparing the medication, less nursing time, um, and so forth. Um, stop, put it, put a stop or a reassess date on appropriate prescriptions. Um, consider a medication trial if we're prescribing a new medication, especially if that is in someone who we think is likely to have a side effect or it's a higher risk medication for a side effect. And another really big impact one is for patients who are on inhalers, please consider switching um, from a meter dose inhaler to a dry powdered inhaler alternative. There is a lot of information on this and on the impact. A simple switch from Ventolin to Terbutaline has a big environmental savings benefit. Interestingly, there's also cost savings benefit, equivalent clinical outcome, and Terbutaline is on a special authority benefit, uh, similarly to Ventolin. So this is a win-win-win uh, with this change and very, very high impact. I think another big win um, is in profiling this, and uh, this is getting at what's called um, tipping points. So the potential for tipping points to change our behavior. I, you know, I was, again, reflecting how we have this information and we're not, it hasn't really translated into a change in practice yet. So we have to talk about this we have to include this in our operations. So again, I'm really grateful for the, the opportunity to present uh, the committee, um, the environmental sustainability uh, page on, uh, on our website. Um, I think there's room for cross-disciplinary work as well. And what I mean by that is it's very, we think in a siloed manner. And to solve a lot of these systems issues, we need engineers talking to technical people, talking to uh, purse holders, talking to clinical people, um, and and just to think about how we may do that more efficiently within our committees. Another opportunity um, is infrastructure and innovation. Um, we have some pretty fancy equipment um, in our realm. Um, there's um, one of our LCAs in the future that we really want to do is a water one uh, because RO uh, has a lot of potential. In discussing this topic recently with uh, my Australian colleague, a simple reprogramming of the, how they were um, using their RO machine, like they turned it on too early basically, so that it was expending a lot of energy and wasting a lot of water. Um, it led to 40% reduction in water use and in energy savings. Uh, it, it really dramatic. So just looking at things that 
we perhaps hadn't thought of before. Um, central acid delivery, sort of what's old is new again. They're taking this up in the UK, considerable environmental savings there. Um, and then there's certainly room for technology, like a point of care um, PD dialysate uh, generation system, which is of particular interest in remote um, or energy poor or energy unreliable areas. I want to stress as well the, the potential that pro-innovation procurement brings uh, via this Green K initiative. And what I mean for that is that we can bring these smaller players into this one discussion and we suddenly have a lot more power to talk to people and corporations that are making our products. Lots of room for advocacy um, in many realms and many personal realms as well. So there's a lot of work yet to be done. I feel like we're finally starting to hone in on the questions um, and the areas that we need to um, and uh, stay tuned for this. And um, I hope I'm at, asked back next year to, to present again on, on our updates. So I want to thank everybody. Um, I want to thank uh, all the organizations that are listed here, but everyone who's done the survey, everyone who's just reached out with an idea, um, that wonderful uh, whiteboard in, in our renal unit and all the enthusiasm and ideas there, just these little um, bits of, of energy and, and tipping points, I think are helping along the way. So we'll see what we can do together. Great, thanks, Carolyn. Maybe we could stop sharing your screen and then we can. Yeah, that's great. Um, so thank you. That's certainly a tour de force and makes us all pause. I think it's, uh, as you know, we actually ask you to give this talk just before Earth Day on purpose. Um, and uh, that's actually a nice way for all of us to remember. But I think in healthcare, um, it, it's good for us to remind ourselves about our contributions, negative and positive, um, to, uh, to green and to uh, carbon emissions. I'm wanting to make sure that people who may have questions um, have a chance to do that. You can either raise your hand and Brenda will unmute you or you can put it in the Q&A. Um, I'd like to go back to the whole pharmacy notion, if that's okay. Um, yeah. Because I think that, you know, there are a few things. We, we give a lot of medications. We uh, believe that bubble packing is a good way to get adherence, but I think that just creates some more cardboard and plastic. Yes. Um, and perhaps, you know, innovating so that some of the ways that we do bubble packing could be more green. Um, just like we used to use plastic bags to take our lunches, and now we use those little reusable bags, those sorts of things. But um, but less medicines is obviously less of all that domino effect. And I, I wonder if maybe um thinking how we might capture all that information if you're going to embark on that deprescribing slash interaction with green might be worthwhile thinking through before so that it's not so it's sort of done with a true ability to capture that information yeah i think that's really important um Measurement in general in this area is is challenging and important, and I think you're right. We need to have some more thought um, on that. Uh, the comment about the the blister packs is a good one. Um, I'm not sure if Naomi's on today. Naomi Glick up in uh, Nanaimo, but she had told me there's a, a one of their partner pharmacies there has a reusable. Um, medication packaging. Um, and that would be a really interesting thing um, to, to unfold. So presumably they could just take them back and sterilize them and, and wash them and reuse them again. But um, that's certainly worth looking into. Yeah. Great. Just seeing if there's any additional questions here. Uh, if, if there aren't, if Sarah's on the line, I wonder if she might like to um, mention. Sarah Thomas? Yeah, Sarah Thomas, if, uh, if she comes. Take it away. Hey Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, great. Yeah, so um, I've been doing some work from a nursing lens because I think nurses have a huge impact. They are often the, the front line. Uh, they see the whole supply chain within the unit. And so we've been working on an um, article for CSN uh, for, for just the nursing perspective. Um, so that is about to be uh, submitted. So that's exciting. We're also doing some work at BC Renal with uh, workforce, as many of you know, 
and we're thinking, you know, we're looking at embedding this into our workforce a bit more, such as, for instance, you know, maybe perhaps if, if we do have a nurse or maybe the renal tech role can can work at um, looking at the environmental footprint. They're the, often the people that, you know, dismantle the machine and, and put it together. And maybe there's some some strides we can make there. Early days, we haven't done much on that, but lots of ideas floating. Um, we're also looking at maybe um, definitely having a representative at the committees on the uh, environmental sustainability piece. I think that's quite important. Um, so there's lots of work being done. Um, a big shout out to Anita again, uh, who's done a lot of great work. We were able, she was able to do um, a study where their unit saved over $2,000 a year just by making sure that the proper waste goes in the proper systems. So um, lots of great work uh, happening. I'm, I'm pleased, Carolyn, that things are starting to shift. People are more interested, people are excited about this work and people wanna do better. So thank you for, for uh, this talk today. Thanks, Sarah. And I think, you know, by increasing awareness of everybody on the team and everybody doing a little bit, that obviously is the goal and trying to work out how you embed some of these roles or, or have some champions, um, I think is a, a really good idea because as you oh, there's a question, as you know, it's not easy to just keep funding. Um, so a good question um, about the green nurse role. Um, and how you might find out more information about it. And then is there a contact email that you would uh, prefer people to send you ideas since you'll be the Oh, top sure. Speaker? Um, yeah, um, caroline.stigant at islandhealth.ca. I'll just put that in the chat. Yes, Great. ideas. Um, Jocelyn also has her hand up if you want to. There you go, Jocelyn, over to you. Yeah, Jocelyn. Jocelyn, do you want to unmute? Are we doing? Oops. Um, you're maybe type it, Jocelyn, because it's hard to hear you. Yeah, Brenda, can you maybe mute her and then a PR perspective to uh it's um maybe uh Jocelyn our partners like back. Oh, I thought I was unmuted. Hear me? I will. Right. Yeah, yeah. You were in and out, but maybe uh, go again. Or maybe type it because you're coming in and out kind of a little bit um, um, fuzzy. But I think Dave might be asking a similar question. It's uh, where do we currently stand with Baxter Canada and recycling of PD can materials? You, can you hear me now? That's better. Yeah, yep. yeah right. better. Yeah, ahead, that's Justin. what I want to know, what we're doing to hold them accountable. Yeah, what are we doing to make backs? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer that question, but I do understand that um, they're receptive to the idea of it, but um, want to cost share in it. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that it's gone much further than that. Um, they have the program established in Australia. There isn't a cost um, to that program that, that I'm aware of. And interestingly, on their website, they have a program as well in, I, I believe it's Guatemala, it might be Colombia, but it, like it's a surprising, seemingly random place. So um, presumably there's local interest and advocacy there. Um, so I think that would get into um, uh, pro probably procurement and contract negotiation material. I'm not really privy to those discussions, but um, I think a bigger issue is what is our infrastructure of currently of medical plastics recycling, and it remains limited. So um, all I know is the PVC123 uh, pilot, which was done in Ontario, uh, in the greater Toronto area. Um, that is still a pilot as best I'm aware. And I'm also aware of a pilot that's being done here in BC and it's in the lower mainland and they don't have the ability to take huge amounts just yet. Um, but they have demonstrated uh, that that's um, scalable and there is an intention to have a Western center um, for medical PVC plastics recycling. Um, 
it's only like it's not all of our plastics uh it's a it's only what has not been in touch with the effluent right so it's the inflow bags so it's not the entirety of pd um or medical plastics but uh it's certainly a place to start i don't have a time scale on when they might accept these but i can say in conversations that i've had with people in recycling this is their business they want product they want a steady supply of good quality product and they will pay for it and I, there are some centers like i think the nhs has this worked out where they're basically selling um, their recyclables to these companies so if we can figure out how to have this steady stream feeding to them of a quality product uh, that's not contaminated and that's that's why i think these um Waste audits are really important in individual units. We may not be collecting it now, but we ought to make sure that we know how to collect it properly so that when the when the gates open and they're accepting our material, we've sorted out what's recyclable and what isn't so that we could uh, make the most of this. So I'd say, you know, local units can just go to work on this um, and, and try to get some quality within their uh, recycling streams. Great. Well, we're actually at time, so it's perfectly mm -hmm. timed. And uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, as you go to work today and celebrate Earth Day tomorrow, perhaps each of us can be that much more conscious um, of all the things that we do and don't do uh, to protect our environment. So Carolyn, thanks again for an outstanding talk. Um, and it's really wonderful to have you as our uh, beacon uh, in this area, both nationally and internationally. So it's um, we stay tuned for ongoing work. Thanks. Thank you. It's, it's a real honor to be doing the work. Thank you.